When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson, and I hope you're ready to pick up and move with me this week. Because last week we spent in Galatia, we started and finished the letter to the Galatians, but it's time to pick up and head west. Now in our scripture study, we've already studied Rome, we've studied, or at least the words to the Romans, we've, we've spent time in Corinth, we've spent time in Galatia, now it's time to spend time in Ephesus. And Paul's letter to the Ephesians honestly is one of my favorites. Six short chapters, but every one of them is an absolute gem. Power packed with principles that we still rely on to this day. There will be some words and phrases, some verses, that as soon as we start reading them, your eyes will light up because out of recognition. There are a lot of famous things in the book of Ephesians. And where, where better to spend some time than in Ephesus? This is a major population center. Galatia was a kind of central Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Uh, Ephesus is a major center on the west coast. In some ways, picture it, oh, east meeting west, as the Ephesians could look out across the sea and Greece is on the other side. So as, as Greek and, and Eastern influence coming together, it's, it's where the Temple of Artemis was, also known as the Temple of Diana. If you think about in the book of Acts where you had these Ephesian silversmiths that were so up in arms because Paul was interfering with their craft, yeah, if they start worshiping this Jesus, they're not going to be worshiping Artemis or Diana, and that's a problem. The temple of Artemis in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So it, it's put this city on the map, and the whole world knows of the Ephesians' loyalty to their patron goddess. But they were right. Paul does have something to say about that. And more and more people are, are following him in the direction of Jesus Christ. He has spent over two years there as a missionary. I mean, you thought some of your transfers were long. No, he spent so much time in Ephesus. It was kind of church headquarters in some ways for, for time he spent, particularly on his third mission. But that mission is over, and he is writing a letter to the Ephesians. Oh, in some ways, just to rejoice with them. Last week in Galatians, Paul was kind of laying down the law. And he was, oh, oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? And calling them back from their backsliding. There was not a ton of praise in, uh, in the letter to the Galatians. There was much more chastisement. Well, Ephesus is the opposite. The Ephesian saints are doing well. And in many ways, what Paul is doing in this beautiful letter is re just rejoicing with them. Can you believe what we have? I mean, he knows these people. He spent so much time living and preaching and serving among them. And... And they're doing great. And he's thrilled for them. He hopes that they will continue in that long after his mission has come to its close. And in some ways, what he's writing to the Ephesians to help them understand what the gospel really is all about, just reminding them of the glories that come from God through Jesus. Those are still things that we can rejoice in to this day. Now, there's one other thing I want you to ponder as we jump into Ephesians. And it's the comparison between the letters that Paul writes to all of these branches of the church and very brief messages that John writes to a bunch of churches in the book of Revelation. Now, when we get to the book of Revelation in oh, December, I think, uh, we will go uh, city by city and verse by verse through that incredible book. And in chapter 2 and 3, there are seven cities of the Revelation, they're called. And Paul will give them just a, a little message, uh, more of a postcard than an actual epistle, but so oh, six or seven, eight verses for each one, usually telling them something about them, uh, something that they're doing poorly and need to repent of, something they're doing great and should be applauded for, and then some kind of promise if they'll just continue following the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm really excited for that cha those chapters when we get there. Okay, They're incredibly relevant and applicable. The reason I'm bringing that up now 
not only to whet your appetite for the book of Revelation, but of all the cities that Paul writes to, and he writes letters to Rome and Corinth and, and Galatia and Ephesus and Colossae and, and Philippi, Th- Thessalonica. In Revelation, John writes to seven cities that are closer together, all packed on the western, sa- the western side of Asia Minor. And of Paul's list of cities and John's list of cities, there's only one that makes both lists, and that's Ephesus. What's interesting to me, the book of Ephesians was written long before the the Revelation. And to see some of the things that Paul focuses on as he's writing to the Ephesians, and then a generation or so later, some of the things that John recognizes there, there's some interesting parallels as far as principles are concerned. And so rather than start in Ephesians 1, can we start briefly in Revelation 2? And just a couple of the verses that he addresses to the Ephesians to kind of lay the foundation of what we're going to be talking about this week. Okay, So go to Revelation chapter 2 and look at verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, and rather than angel, John is addressing the servant of the church. Picture the bishop of the, of the Ephesus first ward. Okay, Stake president of the Ephesus stake. To that servant write this. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Christ is introducing himself to the Ephesians there by reminding them of something about him and something about them, uh, but explaining it in a symbolic way. This man with the seven stars in his hand. Well, we're jumping into Revelation 2. In Revelation 1, John saw that this man was Jesus. And he was told that the seven stars in his hand represent the leaders of the church. And what a perfect metaphor, great symbol. Providing light and guidance and direction. Picture prophets and apostles as stars in the hand of God. And the idea of needing to hold on to those prophets and apostles I mean, if they're in God's hands, then I, I want to be with them so I can be in good hands and godly hands as well. So this focus on prophets and apostles among the Ephesian saints, we're going to see that several times in the letter to the Ephesians that Paul wrote. In fact, you can even see this in verse 2 of Revelation 2. I know thy works, John says, and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. That's, that's high praise. You've been patient. You've been working hard. You've been good. And evil, iniquity, really frustrates you. We're going to see some hints of that in some of the counsel Paul gives to the Ephesians in the second half of his book. But then he says, John says here, Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So a great gift of discernment on the part of the Ephesian saints trying to dis- recognize or discern between true apostles and false ones. And again, if God has the apostles in his right hand, those are the ones you should be following, not falling stars that will only lead us astray. So again, keep an eye out in Paul's letter to the Ephesians for this emphasis on true messengers, prophets and apostles of the Lord. Now, the fact that John would still be talking about that lets you know that Paul's words echoed for a long time among the Ephesians. And then one last verse from Revelation to set the stage. The last line of what of the little postcard John sends to the Ephesians. Revelation 2 verse 7, To him that overcometh. And each of John's little postcards ends with a promise to those who will overcome the world. If you can just hold out and stay strong, here's the blessing God is promising you. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And with that promise, I hope we're thinking Genesis, returning to the presence of God to be able to partake of the tree of life. And I hope we're thinking of Lehi's dream, that if we can overcome the mists of darkness, if we can overcome the great and spacious building and the river of filthy water, then we too will be able to partake of the fruit of the tree of life, which as we know represents the love of God That is another theme we will see running throughout Paul's earlier letter to the Ephesians, that Christ, that God's love made manifest in Christ is there for the taking and the partaking. Eat up, my friends, because this fruit is 
sweet above all that is sweet and pure above all that is pure. It is the most desirable of any other fruit. And the Ephesians know it. They've been feasting on it themselves. And so keep an eye out for that in Paul's letter as well. We are going to be seeing, again, in six chapters, it's, it's really clear the way Paul sets this up. There really is a first half and a second half. And in the first three chapters, he's going to be telling us the gospel and reminding us of the glories of the blessings God has given us. And then in the second half, since we know the gospel and have embraced the gospel, it, it's meant to change the way we live. And so in chapter 4, 5, and 6, our second half of this week, what do we do based on our testimony? How should we live? How should the gospel affect our behavior? Okay, you with me? Excited for this? Absolutely incredible letter. So let's dive in. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul begins with a salutation that we're probably used to by now. Very similar elements to what we saw to the Romans and to the, uh, to the, to the Corinthians. Here to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this should be familiar by now. I, I'm Paul. This is, I'm the one writing you this letter. I'm an apostle, so I'm establishing my authority from the get-go. But remember, it's not me claiming it. It's God giving it. I didn't ask for this position, but God called me to it. And so by the will of God, I'm writing you. And I'm extending grace, God's grace. I'm extending peace, the Lord's peace. In verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the distinction he is bringing up between God and Jesus. God is the Father. He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no hint of Trinitarianism here. That is a post-New Testament development. Okay? As far as Paul is concerned, I want, I, I'll speak of Christ, believe me, but I want to bless Christ's Father for having sent his son in the first place. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Can you picture the rejoicing on Paul's part? Can you believe all that God has given us? Spiritual blessings being stockpiled in heavenly places. And who's the doorkeeper? Well, Jesus which means there's no door. He just throws it wide open. He wants to give us those magnificent blessings. In fact, we could even add, it's not just the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The gospel promises even temporal blessings in earthly places, both here and hereafter. The Father wants to bless us all. And he does it because of this. Next verse. According as he hath chosen us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now think about what he's just said about our, oh, our pre-mortal promises. We've been chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world, even before creation took place. Think back to the war in heaven before there was a war. It was a, a family home evening. No wonder it ended in a fight. Uh, but it began with the father presenting his plan. Remember, he didn't say, what shall we do? Well, he knew what, we, what he was going to do. The question was, whom shall I send? And that allowed us to choose Jesus. And we've, we've hopefully been choosing him ever since. But not only did we choose Jesus, God chose us through Jesus to become like him. Think about the way he put it. He's chosen us in Jesus from before the foundation of the world. Even before earth life began, we were promised heavenly life, heavenly gifts in spiritual places, spiritual gifts in heavenly places. And they're there waiting for us. This is the coach that promised us victory even before the season began. This is the professor that promised that you would not only pass, but ace this course. He's a good teacher. He's serious about this. You've been chosen in Christ even before any of this began. And he chose us to be holy and without blame. Remember in the Doctrine and Covenants when Jesus says, I am able to make you holy? He promised us that. That's what this earth life is for, to sanctify us, to 
train us to have righteous reflexes so that we could reconcile our will to the will of God. That way we not only come back to be with him, but we come back and are like him. And that's the purpose. It's, the, it's what God planned from the very beginning. And we've been chosen by that very plan. Notice how, the Lord, well, how Paul explains it next. Having predestinated us, and that we could say foreordained, that's a word we're more used to, and the Greek would allow for either translation. They mean the same thing. So having foreordained us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, one of the things you need to get used to for the Ephesian saints, and it's a little different than what the, the way Paul wrote other letters, uh, but Ephesians often has really long sentences that can start feeling a little convoluted, especially in the King James translation. And so it's going to take a little effort on our part to try to follow his train of thought. Okay? Uh, we'll try to slow it down and make sure we're understanding what he's saying. So let's go phrase by phrase. He's predestinated us, foreordained us to the adoption of children. So from the very beginning, before we even left the presence of God, the plan was, I want to adopt you back into the family as full heirs. Remember how he said it to the Romans, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. The way he says it to the Ephesians is slightly different. Predestined to the adoption of children, but notice the phrase, by Jesus to himself. Now, is the himself to God or the himself to Jesus? Kind of hard to tell. Uh, it would make sense logically if it's to God, that he's adopting us through Christ so we can be true children of God. But in some ways, we already were. We are the children of heavenly parents. But think about it the way King Benjamin taught, for example, that when we make covenants, we are spiritually begotten unto Christ. He becomes our father. Now, that can be confusing because he's our elder brother. But in terms of covenant relationship, he adopts us to himself so that he can work in us and work through us and work on us so that we can become holy and without blame, as Paul said. In some ways, imagine if you're one of the younger children in a very large family and your eldest brother is way older than you to the point that you barely even knew him growing up. Now, you're still young and that older brother is out of the house by now. But some tragic accident happens and both of your parents are killed, leaving you an orphan. And like I said, you're still young. Who's going to provide for me? Who's going to take care of me? Well, imagine this older brother that steps in like a father figure and adopts us unto him. Now, this is strange. You're already my brother. Yeah, but you need a father right now. And I will take you under my wing and provide for you just like the Father provided for me. In, in, in some ways, especially Old Testament, New Testament culture, that's what the birthright entails. When the Father's gone, that's why you got the double portion, oldest son. So you would have enough to provide for every sibling, every younger brother or sister that cannot provide for themselves. Jesus is fulfilling that role. And to adopt us to Him so that he can then bring us back to the Father. No wonder it's joint heirs with Christ as we become heirs of God. That's been the plan from the very beginning. And it's not just that Christ is a dutiful son and an obedient servant, and it's, yes, sir, Father, I guess I'll go do this and redeem my younger siblings that don't really deserve it. No, no, no. There's no force against his will. Notice the phrase. It's according to the good pleasure of his will. It's his good pleasure. It's his will. It's what he wants to do. Bringing to pass our immortality and eternal life is not just his work. It's his glory. Not just what he does. It's who he is and what he rejoices in. He just wants to bring us home. He's fully invested. We'll see more and more of that. In verse 7 and 8, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Here's a nod to the atonement from the beginning of this letter. Paul, the great theologian of the church, this is how it happens. 
Redemption through the blood of Christ. The forgiveness of sins. That's how we receive it. According to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now, we are going to see six different times in this brief letter, Paul refer to God's riches. In this one, it's the riches of his grace. He, and in fact, he abounds in it. So it is so, Christ and, and the Father are both so gracious. They're so abundant, super abundant in grace. No wonder they can, they can strengthen every weakness on our part. They can pay off every debt. They can fully redeem us. Do you remember when we were studying the Gospels and we studied the parable of the unmerciful servant? Uh, who wouldn't even forgive a paltry debt that some fellow servant owed him. And the irony there and the hypocrisy there was that the king had forgiven this servant basically the national debt. I mean, nobody can spend 10,000 talents in a lifetime. But somehow this servant was guilty of, of incurring a 10,000 talent debt. Jesus is speaking in, hyper, in hyperbole. There's no way you're going to be able to pay this off. But the irony in the story, or the beauty in the story, in the parable, is that the king forgives him. Now, it's one thing, you see, in our country, we have a massive national debt. And you can't just shrug it off. There's not a person on earth wealthy enough to write a check and just absorb the United States national debt. Imagine if there were. That's the king of kings that we worship. The king in the parable absorbs the 10,000 talent debt as if it were nothing. Now that's wealth. That's being rich in grace. I will cover things. Trust me. I can forgive. I'm able to do that. But I also want to back up just a second because I want to prove a contrary here. And Paul, master at proving contraries, there's, he, he tries to find the Goldilocks zone in, practice, in every principle. And in this one, when he's speaking of grace and putting it in, in the context of just this overabundant wealth, okay, it's abounding toward us. Now, careful, you can almost hear Paul or, or sense that Paul is gearing up for a God forbid moment. Like, oh, you mean he's that wealthy? So I can just put it on his tab? I can presume upon his grace, like we learned in the book of Romans? What would Paul say there? Whoa, 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 God forbid. And that's why here I love the end of that verse. Yes, it abounds. Yes, it's rich. But God distributes that in all wisdom and prudence. And that's, that's more of the justice side. That's the more of the careful accounting side. I can cover everything, believe me. But picture someone incredibly wealthy that still balances the checkbook, that still has a budget and makes sure that he knows where all the money's going to go. Well, I mean, how do, they, well, how do you think he got so rich to begin with? Okay, careful money manager. They, he uses wisdom in his expenditures and is prudent not to waste money, willing to spend it whenever it's necessary. Okay, this is no cheapskate, believe me. But neither is he a spendthrift. It's, it's the perfect balance. To me, there's something, something beautiful about a Savior who knows just how big the band-aid has to be to cover the wound. Who knows how to perfectly balance justice and mercy so that we neither presume upon his grace nor fear that that grace is insufficient. I am grateful for the Lord's wisdom. And what do I need to do to fully repent of my sins, to have that godly sorrow well up in me? God's wisdom is such that he wants us to be changed by the experience. And so, of course, the mercy is coming. Of course, the riches of his grace is going to pay all of that. But prudently, wisely, God is trying to help us become more like him along the way.
Okay, fascinating balance here. Then verse 9 and 10, one of my favorite, this is one of the gems in chapter 1. Okay, every chapter has its own gem. This is one of my favorites. 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. And Paul is going to bring up mystery several times in the book of Ephesians. We've got to figure out what this mystery is. Uh, what, I have to have it revealed to me. It's not, it's not obvious. There's some, I mean, God's working in mysterious ways. And what is this mysterious will that he's trying to accomplish. He's going to do it according to his good pleasure. So just like it's his good pleasure to adopt us into the family, this mystery that we're going to discuss in these chapters, oh, God's really excited about that too. He has good pleasure there, which he hath purposed in himself. And so this is something he wants to do, he wills to do. He's got a purpose, he's got a plan. He's going to do this. And, okay, well, what is it? <laughs> Explain the mystery. Please, unveil it to me. Here it is, verse 10. And honestly, this verse has become one of my favorites in the past few years. Often, as I'm doing interfaith dialogue or working with people that are struggling in their faith or trying to reach across the aisle uh, with people that don't agree with me, this passage has come to mean everything. Ephesians 1 verse 10, this is the mystery of God's will. This is what he has good pleasure to accomplish and what he's purposed in himself to accomplish. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. That's the mystery. That's his will and his wish. It's his pleasure and his purpose. It's gathering. Now, when we think gathering, we probably automatically think the gathering of Israel. And that's a huge part of it. Gathering Israel on both sides of the veil. One of the most important works that we can do in this final dispensation. But speaking of the final dispensation, what else are we supposed to wrap up and put a bow on? This is it. Every other dispensation, not that they were procrastinating or kicking the can, but every other dispensation did have a later dispensation to, to do what they were unable to finish. Not us. We've got to accomplish God's work. And what is the work of this final dispensation? That's what, I love the way he's phrasing it. The gospel of Jesus Christ was restored in the final dispensation, the dispensation of the fullness of times. And as we saw in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, what's the, what is it that God really wants to restore? Yes, he restores church and restores priesthood and restores gospel. But the scriptural restoration, according to section 84, is the restoration of his people. I'm trying to reconcile you to me. I'm trying to restore you to who you really are and who I predestined you, foreordained you to become. I'm trying to restore you to right relationships with each other, with, with relationships with me, I'm trying to fix all that's gone wrong. And in the final dispensation, that's when it, the work has to be accomplished. And it's a work of gathering together in one, all things. No wonder all the temple work needs to be done. No wonder all the missionary work needs to be done. No wonder when this dispensation comes to its full conclusion, which is, thankfully, end of the millennium. <laughs> okay, we've, uh, it's gonna, we're going to still be teaching the gospel and still doing temple work in the millennium as well. But if you think about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, restored in these last days to restore God's people, then in some ways we are the custodians of the dispensation of the fullness of times. And what's our job? What is this dispensation assigned to accomplish? Which means, what are we assigned to supervise? The gathering of all things. All things. Not just scattered Israel. Everything. That's a tall order. And a mighty task. But the task is ours. To me, there's something, again, like I said, with interfaith dialogue, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to gather friends of other faiths into an understanding of one another. As I work with friends in the LGBT community, I'm trying to understand where they come from. 
as I work one-on-one -on -one with people who are thinking of leaving the church or who already have. I'm not trying to shame them into returning. I'm trying to understand where they're coming from. Because somehow I have to gather their perspective and experience back in to Christ, gathering all things together in Him. Think about that. If you, I remember this hit me once. I may have even mentioned this when we were studying it in the Doctrine and Covenants. When it describes this earth becoming the celestial kingdom and becoming a sea of glass and fire, a Urim and Thummim in which all things are known. And it struck me, how do you make glass? Well, you take sand and you heat it to, the, to such an intensity that it begins to, to form into this transparent glass. Think about the sands of the sea. Think about the earth itself. But again, the way the Abrahamic covenant describes it, we are those sands of the sea. We are the stars of heaven. The posterity of God upon the earth. Imagine every human being as a grain of sand with their own hopes and their own fears, their own experiences and their own perceptions. And if we're ever going to make this earth a sea of glass and fire, it will be the fire of God that is required to take every single grain and somehow through that brilliant glory fuse us and transfigure us until we become one, one great sea of glass through that fire. In order to do that, we're going to have to gather together. We're going to have to understand one another. What's amazing to me is, think about what we've been learning lately about presiding. And President Ballard has taught this repeatedly and powerfully. The job of the presiding officer is not to make up, the, make up his mind and make the decisions and then start delegating responsibilities to go, go get my vision accomplished. No, that's, that's the old model. And it's, it's not the right model. That's how the world does things. That's not how the Lord does things. So what's the model of presiding in the Lord's way? As the presiding officer, whether it's that, the, the bishop of the ward council or the state president over the high council or the parent over the family council, what's the presiding officer meant to do? Not make the decision and delegate the, the tasks. No, his task is to gather everyone's perspective. This is the principle of scattered revelation, right? God had the puzzle, but he broke it into pieces and scattered it across the entire council. Every member has some. And if I'm presiding, my job is to coax out of every member, give them enough confidence that they feel free to share their wisdom and experience and perspective, their best thinking, their, be their, their spiritual gifts, since they all have one or more, and they have some that I don't have, and so we need each other, right? If that happens, then not only will we come up with the best collective decision, but everyone will have a stake in that decision. And it's not a matter of me delegating, telling them to do something to achieve my vision. They all want to come together to achieve the collective vision. It's genius. So think about, again, if the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is meant to preside over this dispensation of the fullness of times. What's my job as presiding officer? It's not to have all the answers. Rather, it's to gather out the answers from every group that has any, and all groups have some. It's a matter of assembling those spiritual gifts. That's why I'm so grateful to have holy envy when I do interfaith work. It's why I'm so grateful to have empathy and understanding, and not, not pity, but rather, what have you learned along your journey that I have not? What gifts are you bringing to the table? Because our job in this church is to gather together all things in one in Christ. Every godly grain of sand. I need to hear your experience. I need to find out what it's like to live in your shoes. 
reach across racial lines, reach across religious lines, political lines, class lines, gender lines, sexuality lines. It's, you name the grain of sand. God doesn't want to lose a single one. And we have to become more welcoming, more embracing, if we ever hope to gather all things together in Christ. That is the one great whole. And it's our job to make sure the world gets there. Okay? You with me on this? Are we with the Lord on this? This is huge. It's going to take the rest of this dispensation to pull it off. But so much of it is a change of heart on our part so that we're open to those things. Instead of me just trying to force and fuse people into my perspective. Now they've learned some things along the way that we, can, we don't quite get. Okay? Bring it all together in Christ. Now, verse 11 and 12, that, uh, not understanding what a tall order that is and how on earth they're going to be able to accomplish that, well, read the next two verses. In whom, we're still speaking of Jesus, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him. Again, th- he's, all in, he's all in on this, fully invested. He's taking this seriously. This is the inheritance he's trying to share with us, and he's the birthright son. So he's foreordained us. He's promised this. And when it says it's according to the purpose of him, that's, him is is the short version. Paul's going to give us the long version. It's one of my favorite titles for Jesus. It's just way too long uh, to, to, to remember easily. We think of Jesus as the rock or the good shepherd or the door or the way and the truth and the life. How about this? How's this for a title for the Savior? Him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Whew, that's a mouthful. <laughs> okay, But if that's who he really is, that if he wills it, if it's his counsel and his, his commitment, then he's going to work all things according to that. And once I know that about him, that if he put, takes it into his mind and in his heart, he's going to do it, he will accomplish it. Wow, then the next line that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. (laughs) I have every reason to trust in Christ. What a glorious being in whom to place my trust, because he deserves it. In pre-mortality, when we were wondering, is anybody going to be able to pull it off, the mission of the Messiah? When Jesus raised that holy hand and said, here am I, send me, we knew, we believed, we trusted as impossible as his task task sounded, we knew that if it was the counsel of his own will, then he was going to work all things to accomplish it. What I love about that long title is it describes the Lord as one who is infinitely worthy of of, of our trust. Because if... If he wills it, then he will work it. What the Lord wills, he works. What the Lord plans, he performs. He will, again, this is the same Lord who says, I am able to make thee holy. Trust me. Or in the Book of Mormon, I am able to do mine own work. Trust me. And we did first trust Jesus. It's what won the war in heaven. And what will win the war on earth is continuing to trust in him who is able to do all things according to the good pleasure of his will. That's his omnipotence. And we can fully trust in it. Think about what Jesus himself said back in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I get the same sense from Paul here. No fear, only trust. It's the Father's goodwill. And what the Son wills, he works. Bank on it. And then speaking of the bank, look at verse 13 and 14. Paul is still rejoicing in the gospel here. And notice what he rejoices in next. In whom, Jesus that is, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So in premortality, you accepted the plan, you heard the plan and you trusted in it. Here on earth, after having passed through the veil, you've heard it again. 
You heard the word of truth. The gospel of salvation was preached to you. And you trusted all over again. I didn't teach you anything new on my two-year mission among you. I was just there to remind you of things you once believed in. So here we are again. In whom also after that ye believed. So you're believing all over again. And after you've done that, after you've placed your faith in him, notice the next part. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, this is the banking metaphor. And Paul has used it in a previous letter already. He called the Spirit the earnest of our inheritance. And here he's saying it again. I love the imagery. If you picture the down payment we are making on a house, that I have no, I'm not, I'm not rich enough in, in, in grace to be able to afford it, but I, I promise I'll pay you back. In fact, I'm so serious about wanting this house that I will put down some earnest money. It's money I'm giving you to show how in earnest I am about paying off the rest of my debt. Okay? If I default, you get to keep all that. If, if I show that I'm not serious about this, then I lose my earnest money. But I'm serious. And nobody's more serious than the Savior. He has given us, well, let's put it this way. In terms of the, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the fourth article of faith, which maps it all out. I exercise faith in Christ, in whom I first trusted, right? I know he's worthy of that trust because if he wills it, he, he works it. As a result of that faith, I now have faith unto repentance. I want to change my life because it's, it's not quite as Christ-like as it needs to be. I want to be more like him, so I'm changing. In fact, I'm so committed to that change, I'll immerse myself in it. I will covenant to continue, and that's now baptism. But as a result, if I've shown my fully, if I've proven to God that I'm fully invested, how does the Lord prove to me that he is too? Well, by giving me the gift of the Holy Ghost. A constant companion, promising to be with us and work through us and on us so that we can eventually be sanctified through the Spirit. To be able to be as holy and without blame as we were foreordained to be. Okay? See how all these phrases from chapter 1 are coming together? Well, when God gave us the gift of the Holy Ghost, that was just the down payment. I love this imagery, this language, because it changes the way I view the Holy Ghost and the gift that God has given me. That as a little eight-year-old, when my father placed his hands upon my head, I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it was the most glorious down payment I've ever received. And it was the Lord's way of saying, I'm in earnest. I'm fully invested in your salvation. I'm not going to give up until I bring you home. And here's the Spirit as proof. The earnest of your inheritance. You're inheriting, you're receiving the Holy Ghost right now. That's nothing compared to the full inheritance that comes when you're not only with the third member of the Godhead, but with the second and first as well. Celestial glory. This is just a preview. A down payment. And if that's the down payment that will eventually result in the redemption of the purchased possession, the Lord purchased us with his own life's blood. And he will not give up on us until every last debt has been paid. The uttermost farthing. In, in my mortgage, yes, I put down a down payment as much as I could afford. I was in earnest. I want to live here. But every month, I continue to prove to the bank that I'm still all in. I will not default upon, on this loan. Well, what monthly payments is the Lord giving us? It's far more frequent than monthly in most cases. Every time I feel the Holy Ghost again, it is a reminder and a reassurance that the Lord hasn't given up on me. Despite my sins, when I lose the presence of the Spirit, as I repent of them and the Spirit comes rushing back, oh, I haven't defaulted on the loan. Or to use the right metaphor, Jesus is not defaulting on the loan. He has not given up on me. 
I pray that each of us, whenever we feel the Spirit, we take it as the proof God intended it to be. That He's still chipping away on us. He's rich in mercy, but His wisdom and His prudence is such that He wants us to feel that redemption payment after payment after payment. Okay, no wonder we're not presuming upon the grace. It's, oh, it's just paid off. I can pay it all off, piece of cake. I can handle a 10,000 talent debt. Oh, no. My wisdom and prudence is such that it will be line upon line, precept upon precept, sin upon sin, and forgiveness upon forgiveness. So that it changes you through the process. So it keeps us together in covenant relationship through the whole thing. Okay? I don't know what God's amortization schedule looks like, but it's eternal. And he'll never stop working on us until we've reached the redemption of that purchased possession. Well, verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So far, Paul's been rejoicing in the gospel. Now he's rejoicing in his fellow saints. And it's as if he knows God is fully invested. So th there's no reason to worry for you. I know that this ends, up, <laughs> this ends up with your own redemption. You are the purchased possession. And so I rejoice in you. I give thanks to God. I heard your faith. Remember to the Romans? Your faith is spoken of across the world. You're world-renowned you're, you're world for that. Well, if, the Ephesian saints as well, I've heard of your faith. I've heard of your love for all the saints. It's like you're keeping both of the two great commandments. Love of God, the vertical one. Love of neighbor, the horizontal, the horizontal one. You are exactly where you need to be. So no wonder every time I pray, I make mention of you. Thanking God for who you are and pleading with God that he'll continue perfecting you. Actually, if you were to compare the attributes he lists at the beginning with the attributes he lists at the end, the earlier ones seem to be heart-based. Your faith and your love. So grateful for that. Well, to that faith and that love, I'm now praying that God will give you wisdom and revelation and knowledge. And those seem to be more head gifts. And if you had to start with one of them, I'd start with heart too. <laughs> Get your heart in the right place and have faith and love. But then start working on wisdom and knowledge and the revelation that will help you know how to bless and how to help and how to exercise faith in meaningful ways. The head is catching up to the heart here. And that's the hope that Paul has for us all. He then says in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's another thing he's praying for. And if your eyes can fully open, if the light of the Lord can enlighten your understanding, this is what you'll start to see. It's an amazing list. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling. That's the first thing you'll see once your eyes are fully enlightened. You'll see why God called you in the first place. You'll see the hope he has in you. It was faith in you that prompted him to call you into his kingdom. That's the first thing you'll see. Next thing you'll see with these enlightened eyes, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We saw rich in grace. Now we're seeing rich in glory. That's the inheritance he's trying to give you. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Open your eyes, let them be enlightened. And that's what the Lord has foreordained you to receive. Next thing. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, or toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? This goes back to that if he wills it, he will work it. If he plans it, he will perform it. He has that power. He is omnipotent. And if you have the eyes to see, you'll have hope in the calling. You'll know the riches of the glory he set aside for you. And you'll see his power, his mighty power, the exceeding greatness of his power. Can I make it any more clear? I'm trying to enlighten your eyes here. He can do this. He can change you. 
And if you're still lacking proof, the next line, speaking of that mighty power, he says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. That's all the evidence you need. The proof of God's power was made manifest in raising his son from the dead. This is Paul being a witness of the resurrection as usual. And by bearing witness of the resurrection of Jesus, he's bearing witness of the power of the Father to raise life out of death. He did that physically with Jesus, but he's doing that spiritually with the rest of us. And though we have committed sins that are self-destructive. Spiritual suicide is what every sin entails. But I trust the power of God. And the same power by which he raised his only begotten son is the power whereby he'll raise every son and every daughter that's ever fallen into spiritual death. You understand, Paul? I love chapter 1. It's, again, this rejoicing in the plan of salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power and love of God in sending his Son, for God so loved the world, right? He then says in verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. That's the God we worship, far above all of those things. I don't care how how towering the temple to Artemis is. Uh, One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, who cares? How about the ultimate wonder of the eternal world? And that's the temple of God. That's God himself, far above anything here in Ephesus. He's far above every name that is named, whether it's Diana or Artemis or, or any of the silversmiths. He's above it all, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Another beautiful title for Jesus. He fills everything with everything. He fills all in all. Anything you feel you might be lacking in life, he will pour out more than you have room to receive. Every weakness he will fill with strength. Every sin he will fill with forgiveness. Every wound he'll fill with his healing. And every sorrow he'll fill with unspeakable joy. Bank on it. Trust it. He promised he would. And we can hold out hope for that. He's risen above it all. And he descended below all things. He fills the entire gap having hit the bottom and raised everyone to the top. He fills that gap with grace and and it's glorious. <laughs> you ready to go on? I mean, chapter one, ha, ah, thank you for your testimony, Paul. If I got to go to fast and testimony meeting of the Ephesians first ward and Brother Paul was at the pulpit, oh, prepare yourself to be blown away by the things that he knows so well and testifies of so powerfully. Well, he mentioned this mystery, though. And part of that mystery is gathering together in one all things in Christ. But there's more to that mystery as far as the day-to-day operations of the church in a place like Ephesus. And so in chapter 2, he's going to shift gears slightly and go from rejoicing in the big picture to start seeing what, how does this look on, on the ground level. So chapter 2, verse 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. I was hinting about that when we were talking about resurrection at the end of chapter 1. And just like God raised his only begotten son from physical death, he's raising the rest of us from spiritual death. He's quickened us, which just means to be made alive. Okay, We used to be dead in in trespasses, dead in sins. We're now alive. This is Romans 6 all over again, right? Buried in baptism. The old man has been laid under the watery grave, and now I can be raised again in newness of life. Same thing's happening here. And what did we need to be raised from? What's this spiritual death look like? Fascinating description here. Wherein time past, ye walked according to the course of this world. That's our first mistake. And Ephesus would be an easy place to do it. 
I mean, it's got world wonders right there. And all this kind of oh, peer pressure that's all around you and everybody moving in this worldly direction. Ephesus would have been a good place for Satan to take Jesus when he said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth if you'll just worship me. Well, Jesus would have said no, but unfortunately, a lot of people said yes. And Paul is trying to quicken them, trying to bring them out. So forget the course of the world. Next phrase, according to the prince of the power of the air. And that's a fascinating title for the adversary. This is the only place in all of scripture that he's described this way. But talk about a perfect, perfect title. He's a prince who's always wanted to be king, always trying to usurp the father's throne. But what's he the prince of? So he's not even the king that he wants to be. No, no, stay in your lane, Lucifer. He's just a prince. But what's he have power over? The air. That's it. He's nothing but hot air. He's bad breath. I mean, if you think about the, the breath of God that breathes life, quickens the dead, breathes into dust and creates a living soul. Or think about the wind that moved upon the, the waters of creation bringing order out of chaos. Wind and breath and spirit are all the same word in Hebrew. God has good breath, okay? Life-giving breath. What's, it, what's the alternative? It's the, the halitosis of hell. <laughs> it's the bad breath of the prince of the power of the air. Or another way to say that, or just another thing to see here, if it's in the air, it's blown about. Paul will use that idea a little bit later in this letter. There's no foundation. And he'll use that metaphor later in this letter. It's just floating around. Sound like the great and spacious building? With no foundation upon the earth? And it can be blown about wherever the winds of popular opinion might be leading? Remember, are you a reed shaken in the wind? Well, who's the one blowing that wind? It's Satan, the prince of the power of the air. More description. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You're supposed to be children of light. We'll see more of that. You've been predestined to be adopted in as children. But don't be children of disobedience. Don't choose the wrong side of the family. Don't follow Lucifer and become a child of his. He goes on, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of the flesh. And conversation isn't just talking, it's walking. Conversation is your lifestyle. It's, it's, how you, it's how you behave. All of that falls under the heading of conversation. And unfortunately, in times past, we who are spiritually dead, what was our conversation, our lifestyle like? Well, lust of the flesh. Whatever I felt like, oh, just be the authentic you and just go wherever your desires or appetites might lead. Oh, careful there. If you go there, what's the next line? You'll end up fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. A fascinating set of verses here to describe what we're up against. What the adversary is trying to make us become. The desires of the flesh and of the mind. Think about physical appetite. Ooh, there's a desire of the flesh. That's Satan's first temptation to Jesus. And then what about the desires or lusts of the mind? Wrong thinking patterns. Pride going to our head. Oh, that was the second temptation Jesus faced from the adversary. He's unleashing them all on all of us, and we've got to overcome them. Otherwise, we'll end up by nature the natural man. And the natural man is an enemy to God and always has been and always will be until we yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and become a saint through the atonement of Christ. Thank you, King Benjamin, for that. You see what Paul is warning us all about? We've got to come unto Christ or that's what we'll end up becoming. Children of wrath, just like others have, have been. He then says in verse 4, in case we're overwhelmed by, oh great, that's, that's the enemy? That's what I, I've got to overcome? What are my odds? Well, verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, 
Remember, we already saw rich in grace, rich in glory, now rich in mercy. And we're going to need it because in times past, I was dead in trespasses and sins. In times past, I was blown about by Satan's bad breath. But God is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. You see what's motivating his mercy? It's his love. That's beautiful. It's not merciful because I I probably should because they're slackers and I I can't trust them with anything more. It's no, I love these people. And because of my great love, I want to be merciful to them to give them as many chances as they need to change. So it's for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins. He hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. I love that he had to kind of stick that in really quick. One fast insertion just to remind us that's what saves us. It's his grace. It's his mercy. It's his great love. And because of all that, he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. What a beautiful passage. He just wants us to be raised together so we can sit together. You remember in the book of Revelation, it describes a really strange throne. First it says that Jesus sits with the Father on his throne, but then it says that if we overcome, we can sit with him on his throne as well. There's room for everybody. Come come up, little children. Come sit on my lap. I'll hold you on. I'll hold on to you. There's enough room for us all. I'm trying to help you grow up in God. You've got to get used to the, to the seat, okay, the throne. And he wants to share it with us because of his mercy, which is informed by his love. Because of his grace, which is informed by his, his kindness. Elder Maxwell once said to Elder Bednar, uh, I think at the time Elder Bednar was president of BYU-Idaho, and Elder Maxwell had come to speak and was talking with Elder Bednar and said to him, there is no atonement absent the character of Christ. And that blew away Elder Bednar. It blew me away when Elder Bednar told us. The character of Christ, Christ-like attributes are what underwrite the atonement. It's his mercy and his love and his kindness that makes him want to reach out and reach down to us to lift us to his high and holy level. That's the Lord we worship. (laughs) Exceeding riches? Yeah, you better believe it. Now, verse 8, since I mentioned it is by grace that ye are saved, can I just hit that doctrine one more time to make sure it's it's riveted in your attention? Verse 8 through 10, For by grace are ye saved through faith, And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And let me reiterate it just to make it crystal clear. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, hold on to that for a second before we go on to the next verse. Because it's here, usually, that evangelical Christians, our wonderful born-again Christian friends, will pause and say, Whoa, whoa, you Latter-day Saints, please ponder that passage. Because I'm worried about you guys. You guys who seem to come across as, oh... Earning your way to heaven. Working off your debt. Oh, he's rich in mercy. You don't have to pay him back. You're not paying him off. And you're certainly not paying off the debt directly. You can't do it. 10,000 talents. No, it's not of works. Because if it were, you'd end up boasting. Instead of being humbled by Christ's gift, you would boast in the fact that you didn't need to accept one. I paid it off myself. No. Now, Evangelical Christians are exactly right to warn us about that. Remember when we talked about the book of Romans and Latter-day Saints and Evangelical Christians should be able to walk down the same sidewalk hand in hand. But we tend to pick opposite sides of the sidewalk because we're alarmed by alternate dangers. And they're afraid of boasting and we're afraid of coasting. I've had plenty of evangelicals quote to me this passage from Ephesians chapter 2. It's not of works, so quit boasting. And I'm I'm not trying to boast, because that's not why I'm working. But while we're in Ephesians chapter 2, would you mind continuing to read? I'm not going to make you jump all the way to James 
to say that faith without works is dead. I'm not going to bring you to some other far-flung letter of Paul to allow Paul to balance out Paul and give you one of his wonderful God forbid statements that I'm not trying to get you to presume upon God's grace. God forbid that. But here, even without needing to forbid anything, just read the very next verse. So my wonderful evangelical Christian friends, don't stop there. Keep reading. The next verse says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, put 8 through 10 all together in one thought, instead of dividing them up and having evangelicals only quote the first half and having Latter-day Saints only quote the second half. (laughs) Can we quote it all? Because he's given us the Goldilocks zone. He's putting up the the bumpers on the bumper bowling, like he does with his God forbid statements. Here's what he's saying. Your salvation is going to come through grace. There's no other way to get there. It's not going to be your work. You have nothing to boast about. But speaking of work, is there a place for it? Remember, there's a law of faith. And then there's working within God's grace. But it's interesting that it's it's God working and God working in us. Because we're not what we need to be yet. So no wonder we can't just put it on Jesus' tab. No, he's, he's hard at work in that. This is the wisdom and the prudence speaking. To mete out the grace according to his riches, but also according to his wisdom. So we're his workmanship. He's working on us. And what is he working on us to do? Notice, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Oh, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That we're supposed to walk in these works. We'll still be busy people. We'll still be active, anxiously engaged. We just won't be so anxious about that engagement. We'll be striving for perfection, but it's not toxic perfectionism that's motivating us. You understand? This is Danya-san waxing on and waxing off. We've talked about this before. This is our coach putting us through the drills, not to make the team, we're already on it, but so that we can enjoy the game we've been invited in to play. You understand? My works are not to circumvent grace. My works come as a result of God's grace. And I'm not paying him back, but in a way I'm paying it forward to help other people feel the grace of God reaching out to them as well. Are you with me on this? There's, those are the good works. I don't become any less active because of the grace of God. I just become a lot less anxious because of the grace of God. Okay? I'm working for a different reason. It's the reconciliation of my will. All that waxing on and waxing off. <laughs> any, any floor God wants me to sand and any fence he needs me to paint, I'm happy to do it because I know you're training me. It's beautiful. Well, he then says this in verse 11 and 12. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, Earlier he talked about in time past you were dead because you were living in the flesh. Well, now let's make it a little more personal. You were Gentiles. And that's literal here. You were outsiders. But that's all behind us. That's time past. Oh, you who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. And and those were fighting words. That's strong language. Remember when David and Goliath were were talking smack to each other? And what had David said about Goliath? Oh, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? There's nothing to fear in him. He's not even part of the covenant people. So those of the circumcision were usually guilty of looking down upon those of the uncircumcision. That's why Jews and Gentiles never seemed to get along. But that was past. Things had to change. And they have. So Paul says that at that time, ye were without Christ. You didn't have him yet. You didn't know him yet. You hadn't accepted him yet. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, powerful description of being on the outside of things. An alien? Think about illegal aliens. And always looking over your shoulder, worried, I don't belong here. And if they find out, I'll be deported. 
Think about strangers in a strange land. Paul is going to dwell on this metaphor at length in his letter to the Ephesians. And again, such an all-powerful port city, people coming and going left and right, and Jews and Gentiles have lived there for a long time, and we're trying to make Christians out of all of you. You of the circumcision, quit calling the others of the uncircumcision. Circumcision's past, and it doesn't matter if you have or haven't, okay? It's Christians we're trying to become. So, aliens and strangers outside the covenant of promise, all those incredible blessings set aside for those on the inside. Well, what if I'm on the outside? None of that's for me. No wonder I have no hope as I live without God in the world. Think hard if you've ever felt left out. If you've ever felt cut off or passed over or picked last or not picked at all. Parents often worry about that for their children when they move to a new area. And we are strangers here. That's even harder if there's a a language barrier. It's harder if there's some kind of racial line or religious divide. And I'm already sticking out like a sore thumb and nobody wants to bring me in. That's hard. In class, it's bad enough. I don't know anybody that's sitting around me, but at least I'm in class and don't, I'm not supposed to be talking with them. But during recess and during lunch, when people get, get to self-select and sit with their friends and it becomes painfully obvious, I don't have any as I sit by myself and wonder if I'll ever fit in. Paul is using a powerful metaphor here to describe the Gentiles who have come into the kingdom of God. And are you Jewish Christians going to treat the Gentile Christians as if neither one of you were Christians at all? Are you going to still keep them on the outside of things? Because that's wrong. If, we're going to, if we ever hope to gather together in one all things in Christ, then the least we can start with is gathering each other in in love since supposedly we're all brothers and sisters in the faith. The way he says it in verse 13, but now, so forget the, the time past where you were Gentiles and they called you uncircumcision. Forget the past. We're in the present. So now, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. It's that blood that washes away the separation. It's the blood that brings us together. It brings the far off nigh. Come unto me. Paul says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And that middle wall, in some ways that's too soft a translation. What the King James translators gave us is, oh, it's just kind of this like, oh, picture that little half wall between your cubicles at work. Oh, but you're constantly kind of peeking over and, hey, well, how's, how's, how's life treating you? And we doing anything after work today? And what, what's your weekend plans? And, oh, yeah, it's just this middle wall. No, it's stronger than that. In fact, the New International Version translates that the dividing wall of hostility. Oh, that's stronger. Or how about the contemporary English version? The wall of hatred that separated us. That's what the blood of Christ is trying to wash away and break down. In the temple of Jerusalem, there were different levels of holiness, right? Well, there was a court of the Gentiles, where at least, I mean, Gentiles, even those, oh, those nasty uncircumcised, well, you can get semi-close. You can come onto Temple Square, close enough for you. But there was a middle wall of partition there was some kind of banister or balustrade that marked where the uncircumcised could come and where they could not. None shall pass. You're not welcome here in the court of the Israelites. 
Well, do you remember what happened since we're at the Temple Mount? Do you remember what happened inside the temple when Christ spilled his final blood on the cross? When the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. This is God opening the door so that humanity can come in to his presence. Well, if that was happening inside the temple, what was happening outside? The veil separating humanity from divinity was torn. Well, the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile was being broken down as well. It's such a powerful image Paul is giving us. Tear the thing down. Tear down this wall. <laughs> you can hear Reagan saying it, right? The, the Berlin Wall is separating a city never meant to be separated. Two countries that really need to become one. West and East and an Iron Curtain. Tear the whole thing down. Become one here. Break down the middle wall of partition. He then says in the next verse, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, or of two, one new man. So making peace. That's how the Lord does it. How does he break down the middle wall? Through his blood. How does he abolish enmity? Well, through his flesh. Wait, flesh and blood? And through the shedding of his blood and the bruising of his flesh... Two can become one. Outsiders can be made insiders. Divisions can be erased. And everyone can come into communion. Are you thinking of the sacrament yet? The sacrament is, make, is meant to make us one. If you are not one, you are not mine, the Lord says. So how do we become his? We become one another's. We, we live the second great commandment so we can truly live the first. You get this? It's mind-blowing to me how well Paul is trying to describe, is describing these things. And through what Christ did, Gethsemane and Calvary, the atonement, the at one -ment. Well, there you go. Because of his at one -ment, there's no middle wall separating us from God or separating us from each other. It's through the atonement that Christ makes it possible to live the first and second great commandments. And it's in the sacrament, as we renew those covenants with him, that it's meant to erase the dividing lines between one another. That's why it's called communion. I've mentioned this before. In other churches, when they pass the peace before they partake of communion, I'm trying to break down middle walls of partition that might separate me from anyone else in this congregation. Think about prayer in the holiest of places. And there can be nothing that divides us from one another. Or God cannot fully participate. There's things dividing you from each other. And that, in and of itself, is dividing you from me. So come into communion. Let's break down enmity, which is opposition. Here, when he says it's through the law of commandments contained in ordinances, I'm not trying to get rid of commandments in general or ordinances in general. Those are all important. But the specific legalistic commandments of the law of Moses, the specific ordinance of circumcision, those have been fulfilled in Christ. And they're no longer necessary. Become one. And if we'll do it, look at verse 16. If we let the Lord do it in us, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, that's you Gentiles, and to them that were nigh, that's you Jews, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Jews, you're in just as much desperate need of Jesus as the Gentiles are. There's no way for any of us to come home without him. And so through that blood, through that atonement, through that self-sacrifice, he's banished enmity. He's broken down walls. He's made two one. He's allowed us to preach peace. And one spirit and one father, we're all coming unto God. Has anyone ever done that for you? Has anyone ever, ever preached peace 
to you that were afar off by bringing you closer in. It's one of the kindest things we can do when somebody moves into the neighborhood. It's not just reach out and drop off cookies and hi, I'm, I'm your neighbor. But can I introduce you to a bunch of other neighbors too? Uh, we want you to be part of the group. And rather than just stay in our own little clique, it, we want everyone to come into the community. It's when you're at a, a party or your new day at school or you're sitting by yourself in the, in the cafeteria and somebody comes and sits with you or better yet comes and invites you to come and sit with them and all their friends. Oh, no more afar off. Come on in. I've seen some of that performed in my own ward in such beautiful ways by people that are working with refugees that have come to Utah and talk about being afar off and now they're nigh. And all kinds of language, language barrier and cultural distinctions and religious differences and everything. And on the one hand, there's a lot of amazing work that's done of gathering shoes and clothing and so on and, and donating it. And that's beautiful. It's a beautiful start. But I've seen sisters in our ward, my sister-in-law herself has done a lot of this as well, where it's not just I'm here to drop off some clothing. It, I'm here to help you learn English. And I'm here to help you get your kids enrolled in school. And I'm here to help you fill out some job applications and, and try to help you get your feet underneath you here in a new land. That's amazing. That's good Samaritans for you. Yeah, that's a celestial soul. And then Paul gives this amazing analogy. He's been working toward this, okay? But he finally says it in its, in its, in its strongest form in verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, which means God's family. You're part of the family now. You've been adopted in. And in fact, we don't even have to treat you like some adopted pseudo sibling. No, you are every bit as much a part of the family as we are. My wife's family, in fact, is like that in such a beautiful way. When my wife's biological mother passed away, she left seven children behind, 12 and under. Young family. Boy, did my father-in-law have his hands full. And later, when he met someone brave enough to become instant mother of seven, that's a miracle in and of itself. But when they had three more children between them, there's now 10 kids in the family. Seven and three half siblings, right? Well, I guess technically. But I've never sensed that in my, among my in-laws. In fact, they don't even feel like in-laws. They have fully brought me into the family. I'm as close to the, my brother's in-law as my own brother's. And I, it doesn't feel like law. It just feels like love. And it's amazing how it, it, it's no half sibling between my wife and those three younger, youngest siblings. No, it's all just one. To think about becoming... Well, think about Isaiah 56, for example. Remember that last year? Strangers and eunuchs in Israel. And if you want to feel afar off, then be a stranger in Israel. Where it's our land, and it's the promised land, and it's not for you. Or imagine a eunuch, unable to have posterity, in a, in a community that is defined by its focus on posterity. To be single in a family church is the equivalent, right? They'll never fit in. And, what's I, and yet, what does Isaiah 56 promise? You will. God has a place and a name for you that is better than sons and daughters. You will not be left out. I, I wonder if Paul's language here is part of the fulfillment of Isaiah 56's promise. Come, be nigh, be one with us. You're no longer a stranger because now I know your name and you have a place and a name among us. Eunuchs, oh, God's given you something better. Compensatory blessings and come and let me share all these blessings with you. I absolutely love this imagery. It actually made me think about this in a literal 
way of becoming a fellow citizen with the saints. Do you remember in the book of Acts when Paul was getting roughed up and he's carried off and he talks to the Roman soldiers and says, well, well you're going to really do this? You're going to treat a Roman citizen this way? And the soldier's like, you're a citizen? It's like, wow, I had to buy my citizenship. And Paul's like, oh, I was free born. It's like, ooh, yikes, you even outrank me as a citizen. But since you're a citizen, you have certain rights and privileges. Well, what Paul is saying here is everyone should. We're all fellow citizens with the saints. You don't have to show me your green card. Now you're... <laughs> it's interesting to think about the United States as a nation of immigrants. And they were willing to come in. And those that were afar off came nigh. And yes, there were all kinds of middle walls of partition. But somehow the great American melting pot fused us into one. E pluribus unum. At least it's meant to. We've got to get past those differences. And actually, rejoice in the differences that people can bring in and gather together in one, all things in Christ. Right? Same imagery that we're still building upon. That's the task of this dispensation. But to become fellow citizens, I looked up online to see what a naturalization ceremony entails. An interesting word, naturalization. That's the word we use for obtaining citizenship. But there's even a, a biological form of that, verb, or of, that, of that word. Because you naturalize plants and animals when you introduce them into an area where they're not indigenous. But you help them take root so they grow in this new environment as if it were natural to them. The animals begin to make themselves at home in this new area and it starts to feel natural to them. That's what naturalization is. And so to think about a foreigner coming into the United States and eventually be receiving citizenship through a naturalization process. We don't want the natural man. We already saw that in a previous verse. But to become natural members of the body of Christ, it's not some foreign object that's been grafted in. In fact, grafting's a miracle. It becomes part of the tree. Right? You understand the metaphor? Well, how's this for naturalization? You are meant to take an oath of allegiance. And this, I, I looked up the one, and I'm sure there's similar oaths uh, if you're naturalized in other countries as well. But let me read to you the naturalization oath of allegiance to the United States of America. Picture a foreigner coming in and accepting this promise, or making this promise. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen. That's the first step. We are breaking old ties entirely. Why? So I can forge new ones in their place. But I, I'm renouncing the old, my old allegiances. Can you sense Paul hinting about that? That I'm, I'm turning my back on the prince of the power of the air. I want nothing to do with him. I, I, I'm not interested in the lusts of the flesh or the mind. I'm not going to be the natural man. I want to be naturalized into the kingdom of God. So I don't want anything to do with that old life. I've buried it. I've crucified it in Christ and then buried it in baptism. Step one. Then step two that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Oh, and if they're foreign, that might even include the foreign country I used to be a citizen of. Oh, good thing I broke down those old allegiances. I have a new one, and I'm all in. I'll support it. I'll defend it against anyone who attacks. I, you see, I'm not going to be merely neutral. Once you come into the kingdom of God, you've left neutral ground forever. And that's the part of the naturalization process. But it's even more than that. Part of the positivity, not just neutrality, but positivity, next part of the oath, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And if that's not perfect language for conversion, I don't know what it is. It's not just I, bear, I, I pledge allegiance to the flag, but I bear true faith to all that it represents. And then the end of it is really interesting. Part of what I'm promising to do is that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law. 
I'll go to war for you. That I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law. So if I'm not going to war, I'll still come and serve. And finally, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by the law. That's fascinating. A naturalized citizen is willing to go and do whatever that nation needs from them. Whether it's to fight the good fight, take on the enemy, whether it's to give whatever service I'm called to render. I love the last one, to perform work of national importance. And I'm amazed by converts coming into the kingdom of God, willing to defend the faith, willing to accept callings, willing to perform work of eternal importance. Oh, that's allegiance. That's fellow citizens with the saints. And then the oath ends. And that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. So help me, God. And yes, God will help you with all of that. It's my own free will. And it's the pleasure of his goodwill to make all of this happen. Like I said, this is our, the United States is a nation of immigrants. And I picture my own ancestors who once were afar off, coming nigh, and passing into New York Harbor from the nations of Denmark or Italy and France and Sweden, Scotland, and the British Isles. Ancestors from all over Europe, in my case, who came in, and those that came a little later than others, got to pass beneath the torch of Lady Liberty. But Lady Liberty is only one nickname for that beautiful statue. Emma Lazarus wrote the poem, The New Colossus, to describe this colossal statue. And in it, one of the nicknames, one of the titles given to this statue, a statue is not Lady Liberty, it's Mother of Exiles. And that's interesting. To think about this mother hen extending her wings to bring us in. This mother lifting her lamp to shine that light of liberty to exiles. To people who realize there's no going back. This is my only hope. But part of that poem, some of the most famous lines that are etched at the base of the Statue of Liberty, listen to them once again. And picture this mother of exiles reaching out across the earth with this invitation. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed, to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Can we make the church equally welcoming? Maybe we need the signs on the sides of our chapels to be a little bigger. So instead of just saying, visitors welcome, it invites the wretched refuse of the world to come and be cared for, to come and be gathered in, huddled masses yearning to breathe the breath of life, to be free from whatever fears and challenges they faced outside the kingdom of God. My friends, we have to break down middle walls. And we especially have to break down walls of hostility and enmity. We've got to love. We've got to invite. We've got to naturalize. Until the kingdom of God on the earth is the most glorious melting pot that's ever taken place. In fact, it melts into a sea of glass and fire. Where we know all things. Including the lived experience of every child of God. Well, how do we get there? <laughs> Tall orders left and right. When we saw that tall order in chapter 1, we were reminded about Jesus, that he can do everything. 
And now that we're given this tall order in chapter 2, what are we next reminded of? Look at verse 20. That we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now that's a metaphor that's famous to every Latter-day Saint. The foundation of prophets and apostles, oh yeah, we perk up our ears with that. Remember what we saw in the book of Revelation, that even a generation later when John is writing them, they're still making sure that they're tied down to a true foundation and trying to discern between true apostles and false ones, true prophets and false counterfeits. This is a foundation upon which we've got to build. That's one of the ways we become one. We all focus on the same single, singular cornerstone, Jesus himself. And we base our lives around the foundation that the apostles and prophets have laid for us. This is how one big building starts to rise. And what kind of building is it? Again, no offense to the temple of Artemis, <laughs> but you got nothing. We're trying to build the temple of God. And like Paul said to the Corinthians, we are that temple. And not just me individually as my body is a temple, but we collectively form the body of Christ and the building of Christ. Collectively, we become a temple of the Lord, and it's got to be holy. It's got to be one. We've got to be fitly framed together. Think about that. That everything's tied together. It's, it's one solid structure. So that no matter what happens in the earthquakes in diverse places and the shaking of faith in the latter days, oh, this thing's going to hold because it's holding together. I've got you. Let me steady the shaken. Let's hold it on to each other and together we can progress through the mist of darkness to the tree of life. We're all built together on this. There's something powerful about that kind of unity especially in the construction world. Think about, for example, what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount about the wise man versus the foolish man. Don't build on sand, build on rock. But think about this. Even if you built on rock, you've got to be connected to it somehow. In the Luke version of that, it said that they dug deep. Mm, so they're digging into the rock so that they can lay the foundation in it. Now picture a chief cornerstone it's the big one. Everything's going to be kind of pushing up against that. So there's Jesus. First and foremost, he's the most important part of any foundation we lay. From him, pull out your compass and square, for example. Uh, those instruments of construction that are so important. So we can make sure that things are straight and things are square. Things are firm. And so from the chief cornerstone, we will send out in one direction and then at a 90 degree angle, the other. We're going to make sure it's nice and square together. Here are prophets and apostles. And all together, drilled into the rock of the Redeemer himself. Now there's a sure foundation. But what's going to go on top? We're trying to build a temple here. Uh, but to, we have to connect the superstructure to the foundation itself. Just like the foundation has to be connected to the rock, the building has to be connected to the foundation. It's interesting, sometimes in a construction site, when they're pouring the footings, the foundation, when the cement is still wet, sometimes they'll take these very large bolts and stick the top, they'll turn it upside down and stick the top of that bolt into the wet cement with the threads of the bolt sticking up above and then let the whole thing harden so that those bolts are truly anchored in to the foundation. That's why they call them anchor bolts. And with the threads pointing upward, now I can drill a hole in the frame. Okay, now it's the, the, the wood, the two by fours are coming together. And as I'm framing the house and trying to fitly frame it all together, I mean, those are studs and, and heavy 16 penny nails and I'm tying everything together as tightly as I can, but it's got to be permanently connected to the foundation. Otherwise, can you imagine, worst case scenario, the wind or the earthquake or whatever it is, imagine the house holding together and the foundation holding together, but the house and the foundation coming apart. And it just kind of gets sheared off because of that force and the whole house just slips right off its moorings. You got a problem. So with those anchor bolts, 
bolt it down, take the frame and bolt it to the foundation. Nothing's moving here. How tied are you to prophets and apostles? How well do we know their words? How well do we follow their teachings? How grounded are we in the gospel of Jesus Christ that they preach? It's such a gift to have prophets and apostles. I know they don't claim to be infallible. That's None of us are either. But what they are called to be is as intensely intentional as any mere mortal can be at ascertaining the will of God. I'm amazed they accept that responsibility. To live a life as grounded in the cornerstone as you can get so that the rest of us can rest assured that we're built upon solid footings. Okay? Fitly framed together. That's, again, this idea of unity. And every part. To the Corinthians, it was body parts. And all the bodies got to tie together. To the Ephesians here, it's construction. And again, when you've got one of the wonders of the ancient world constructed in your own city, pretty good metaphor to use, Paul. Well done there. And it's with that that Paul then shifts to chapter, what we have now is chapter 3, where he brings oh, the Gentiles even closer in. That's his job, after all. He has been called as the apostle to the Gentiles. We've seen that clearly already. And so what can I say to my Gentile brothers and sisters to help them really feel like fellow citizens and part of the household of God? We'll turn to chapter 3 and see how Paul begins this part of the letter. Verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. And that doesn't sound like a very... Oh, pleasant title. And yet for Paul, oh, he owns it. I'm fine with that. I'm a prisoner of Jesus because guess what? I am captivated by Christianity. Absolutely entranced by it. It's incredible. Remember back in the book of Acts when he stayed in the prison, even when the walls came a-tumbling down and shouted out to the, to the jailer, don't hurt yourself, we're still here because I'm a willing prisoner. I am happy to do anything God asks of me. So here I am, the prisoner of Jesus. I'm, I'm called to you Gentiles. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, or toward you, we would say. Have you heard it? You Gentiles, didn't I tell you? God has dispensed grace all over me. Way more than even I can handle. And so I'm trying to spread it to everyone else. That's what a dispensation is for. The best I, the, the, I, I had my insight into what a dispensation is once in the bathroom as I was washing my hands. Because where did I go to find the soap? Oh, to a soap dispenser. And all of a sudden it clicked. Oh, a dispenser dispenses a dispensation of soap. Great. So what is a dispensation of the gospel? Picture the Lord looking down and going, oh man, everybody's got dirty hands and dirty hearts and all kinds of cleanup is necessary. So let's take someone who is ready and willing to accept the task. Someone willing to sign up as my prisoner, a captive to my message and my cause. And let me dispense a dispensation of the gospel upon them. In this case, upon Paul, may I dispense a dispensation of grace. You knew you needed it. You were afar off from the Christian covenant, but I brought you in. In fact, I dispensed so much grace on you that for the rest of your life, you've been going around inviting other people in, other outsiders, particularly among the Gentiles. Now that, now that you have that dispensation, now you've heard of it from me, Paul goes on in the next verse, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. You remember back in chapter 1 when he mentioned the mystery? And part of that mystery was gathering together all things in one in Christ. Here he gets back to this idea of the mystery, and it's a mystery that Paul gets now, he understands. And what God had revealed to Paul was the mystery of how do you turn a Gentile into a Jew? 
without having to pass through Judaism <laughs> in the process? Oh, well, you all become Christians. That's how it works. The mystery is how do I, how do I change people's hearts? Well, I help them tap into the power of God. He changes them. How do I make strangers and foreigners into fellow citizens? That's the mystery. How do I graft some wild branch into a tame tree? I mean, that's amazing. Have you ever seen like a YouTube video on, on how branches are grafted? That's all of Jacob 5 for you, right? And it is such a wild process. It's like, does that actually work? The fact it does, what a mystery. But a mystery we've solved. Well, I think the greater mystery that mm, still needs some solving is how do we break down middle walls of, of partition? How do we overcome racism or sexism or prejudice? How do we become one in Christ? That's the mystery that Paul's been taught, and he's trying to teach it to the rest of us. So he says in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. They just didn't get it. And that's okay for their time period. It was us against them, and God is trying to gather a chosen people, trying to give them a sense of identity. But that was only temporary. It was never meant to be permanent. It was exclusivity in pursuit of inclusivity, right? In thee and in thy seed. That's the exclusive part. Shall all the families of the earth be blessed? That's the inclusive part. But how do we get there? Nobody knew. I mean, they tried as best as they could, but that was our Jewish past. How about our Christian present? Keep reading. In other ages, it wasn't made known, but it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. No wonder we need to build upon that foundation. They get it. Peter had his vision before he met Cornelius. I've had my vision on the road to Damascus. I, I tried in synagogues. I went out and preached among Gentiles. And we had a Jerusalem conference with James's help. It's being made known to current apostles and prophets because it wasn't revealed to the past ones. If that doesn't tell you why we, there's an ongoing need for apostles and prophets, I don't know what, what does. It's, it's new news. It's a new, albeit everlasting covenant. And so thank heaven for these modern apostles and prophets that are making these things known by the Spirit. And what are they made known? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Oh, it wasn't just fellow citizens. It's fellow heirs. It's not just one building. It's one body. It's partaking together of the promises of Christ. Wait a minute. I thought those promises were set aside for those that were foreordained to receive it. Isn't that the house of Israel? Well, yeah. Along with anybody who's adopted in and quit looking at them as, as half brothers or sisters. They're full. Okay? There's such a beautiful promise here. It's as if they were natural born with any other of the children. They're part of the family of the faith. So Paul then says in verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. How's that for a calling? I was made a minister. I mean, prisoner of Christ, yeah, you might misunderstand that. But as a minister, that's what I'm captivated by, the chance to share the good news with everyone else. That's the gift God gave to me. That's the grace God gave to me to be able to perform this ministry. And it's his power that is working in me. And boy, it's working effectively or effectually, as he said here. Okay? And he did it unto me, Paul continues, who am less than the least of all saints. Can you believe that? Me, little old Saul, becomes mighty Paul as God commissions me and calls me and empowers me to share the good news of oneness in Christ. So yeah, least of all the saints, that's me. But this grace has been given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's how rich he is in mercy, how rich he is in grace, how rich he is in glory. It's unsearchable. No wonder he can absorb a 10,000 talent debt. No wonder he never tires of forgiving us. 
And now that I understand that, Paul says, I was also called to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. The fellowship of the mystery. Uh, we will see fellowship of suffering. We'll see fellowship of grace. But the fellowship of the mystery, I, 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 want, I want to be led in on that. I want to be part of the fellowship. I'm not talking some kind of, oh, esoteric knowledge, and here we are, the Gnostics coming together, thinking we're better than other people because we know stuff. No, there's something more selfless about this particular fellowship. We've come together with an understanding of the mystery. Christ really does change people. I've seen it. Haven't you? Oh, yeah, we have. We're part of that fellowship. I was once an outsider. I'm an insider now. I was once afar off. He's brought me nigh. I was a foreigner, but I'm a fellow citizen, and I know what it's like because I've experienced it. I want everyone else to experience it too. Sign me up for captivity in Christ. Make me a minister and let me share the good news and solve the mystery people keep wondering about. How on earth do you Latter-day Saints, how have you become one? It's the most fascinating thing. Even historians of religion scratch their head thinking, Latter-day Saints are the, are the first time we've seen anything since Judaism itself that has created not just a faith, but a people, like a culture. It, Latter-day Saints are more than just a religion. They really are a, a culture. They're a people. And that's a mystery. Well, we're part of that fellowship of the mystery. The Lord has taught us how to become one. Now, granted, there's still a lot of work for us to do. <laughs> we know the mystery, but we haven't always put down all the, all the right steps. Okay? There's still a lot of gathering together in one in Christ that we need to accomplish. But we've been taught how it's done. So verse 10, All this mystery has been revealed to the intent that now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. I love what he says at the end there. I'm bold. I've, I'm confident. I, I'll admit. But when you have faith in the Lord, what's there to fear? When you've been promised things and foreordained to receive them and called into his ministry, <laughs> fear disappears. So boldness, yes. Confidence, you better believe it. But it's not just me on this side of the veil. It's those on the other. The way he starts this passage in verse 10 is so interesting. Hard to understand a little bit. But when he talks about the principalities and powers in heavenly places, picture the angels themselves. Picture, oh, the heavens watching what we're doing here on earth. Oh, will they be able to pull it off? Will they live up to the calling they've been given? Here we have all these spiritual blessings in heavenly places just waiting to bestow upon them. But are they living up to the, the calling they've been given? Well, here when it says that to those principalities and to those powers, it's going to be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And that's really fascinating. That Wait a minute. We here on earth, the church, is somehow going to convince the, the heavenly powers about the wisdom of God? How do we do that? Well, prove God right. Prove that God is wise enough to reveal the mystery to us. And as we become one with one another, as all things are gathered together in one in Christ, can you picture the, the heavens themselves looking down in awe and wonder at what a bunch of mere mortals are pulling off? Like, look at them. The kids are figuring it out. They're becoming one. They're breaking down middle walls of partition. They're bringing in foreigners and making them fellow citizens. Father, it's not that I ever doubted you, I, but I might have doubted them. But look at them. They're proving just how wise you were in commending that ministry and mystery to them. I'd love to have an angel jaw drop because of how united we've become.
not only as a church, but as a human race. Then, verse 13, Paul says, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. So yeah, don't get discouraged just because I'm going through hard things. I signed up for it. I'm the prisoner of Christ. I'm suffering for you, and don't worry about that. In fact, you should feel honored by the, the, the fact that I, would, that I would suffer tribulations on your behalf. That is your glory, is what Paul just said. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm down on my knees in prayer. And what am I saying? Oh, praising him of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And I'm asking him that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, there's that wealth again, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's what I'm praying for. I'm not going to give up on you. So please don't give up on me. I'm not going to faint because of my tribulations. So please don't faint over my tribulations either. we got to stay standing and I'll support you if you'll support me. Actually, it's the Spirit that's going to support us all. He will continue to strengthen us by God's almighty power. He knows that we've got a tough task ahead. Then verse 17, That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. I love that, that verse. To be rooted and grounded? How's that for a foundation and a chief cornerstone? That is the rock of redemption himself. To be rooted, how's that for a tree of life, sinking the roots down deep so it cannot be blown away at all? To be rooted and grounded in what? In love. That's beautiful. That's the foundation I'm trying to drill down into. That's what I, the boats I'm trying to be anchored to. The love of God. And as Paul says it, you can't get that love. You can't comprehend it. It's breadth, it's length, it's depth, it's height, it's beyond you. It's immeasurable. Remember that beautiful passage in Romans? That neither height nor depth nor any other creature can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, I hear Paul saying similar things. Breadth and length and height and depth. Oh, Christ's love. Or the love of God made manifest through the gift of His only begotten Son. You'll never be able to measure it. Don't worry about that. Just root yourself in it. Ground yourself in it. And you will come to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. <laughs> You'll never fully understand it. That's part of the mystery, too. Okay. And then he closes this first half in verse 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. That amen tips us off. That, that he really is closing one thought and about to open another. This is the perfect place to stop and take a breath for a moment. The amen there. But what's he amening? What's he bearing his testimony of? That Christ is able. We saw a long title earlier in chapter 1. That if he takes it into his will to perform, he's going to work it out. He's going to do it. That's who he is. But here's another one. Another really long title that I absolutely love. Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or even think. What do you need? If the mystery is beginning to make sense to you, but there are still middle walls of partition that need to be broken down, if you're feeling like an outsider or you know people who feel that way themselves, how do we bring them in? How do I become one with one another? Despite all of our differences, the world has no clue but the kingdom of God, we've we got to figure this out. And the Lord is revealing it, it to us through prophets and apostles. President Nelson is reaching across middle walls. He's establishing relationships with 
the NAACP. And, and that's making a difference. When, Elder, when President Irene went to the Vatican and got to meet the Pope, we're, we're, we're reaching across aisles to see all the good that's being done, not only on the general level, but in wards and stakes and branches and districts across the church, to become one with people all around them. Beautiful interfaith work, humanitarian aid, coming together, brothers and sisters in arms. The Lord's able to do it. He's, if, but if we ever doubt it, then come back to the end of Ephesians 3. And who has called us to the work? The one who wills that we get it done. And then the one that enables us and empowers us to accomplish it. If you are hesitant to ask for the help you need, ask for it. If you can't even think of all the things that you're going to need to be able to accomplish it, don't worry about it. He's exceedingly, abundantly able to do even more than anything you could ask for or imagine. That's the Lord we worship. No wonder we're not trying to gather everything into us. We're trying to gather everything into him. And I testify that Christ makes room enough. His arms are stretched out still to gather us all in to his eternal embrace. So far what we've seen in Ephesians is pretty awe-inspiring. And there's still a second half that lies ahead. But if we can pause here with the, the promise in our ears that Jesus is able, no matter what the task ahead, no matter, no matter what he's asked us to do, he is able to do exceeding abundantly above anything we might ask him to accomplish.